The second installment of Russell Dowderman's Costumes Throughout the Year series features Rogue, and it was the variant cover for Excalibur number 18. In this cover, we get to see almost all of Rogue's costumes, starting from her rough days with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, all the way through her iconic 90s, and down to some of the more recent stuff that she's been wearing too. I count a whopping 17 costumes in total on this cover, and in this video, I'm going to rank each and every one of them, starting from my least favorite to my most favorite. I'm also going to be giving a little bit of history about each of the costumes and going into who Rogue was during those eras. Some of the other covers in this series feature Jean Grey, Psylocke, and Storm, and I already have ranking videos done for most of these covers, so be sure to check those videos out after watching this one. In terms of my overall opinion of Rogue, she's never really been like a favorite character of mine, but I do think that she's one of the most compelling ones. I've always enjoyed the contrast of her having like a sweet, affectionate, Southern Belle style personality, but with like an uncontrollable absorption ability that stops her from ever being able to get close to anyone. It's a tragic fate, but tragedy is what makes good characters great characters. All Rogue has ever wanted was to be loved by others, but the poor girl has been used by people and has unintentionally hurt people to the point that I felt like her character was destined to always just end up making the best out of a bad situation, but never truly ever experience happiness. This all changed over time though, and Rogue eventually does learn how to control her abilities, and she becomes much more of like a self-assured, confident, capable leader type of character. It's an evolution that is certainly a lot more refreshing than just watching her cry over not being able to touch her boyfriends all the time. Rogue has charisma out the yazoo, and she's got one of the most defining speech patterns of all the characters out there with casual accents. So even though she's not like an all-time favorite of mine, it is always a treat when a well-written Rogue's Mississippi sass graces the page. But enough about all of that, let's get right into the ranking. Here are 17 Rogue costumes ranked from my least favorite to my most favorite. Number 17, Ultimate Rogue. I didn't read much of Ultimate X-Men, but from what I've gathered, Rogue had a pretty interesting run in it. Much like her 616 counterpart, the Rogue in this reality was used as a pawn for villainous organizations upon her debut, starting with the Weapon X program, and then later with the Brotherhood of Mutant Supremacy. But as all rogues do, she eventually joined up with the X-Men, and this was the costume she wore when she did. It's pretty much part of the overall Ultimate Team aesthetic, where everyone was wearing blue and yellow costumes similar to this one. Seeing the team in these matchy-matchy outfits reminds me of the old Jim Lee training uniforms that the X-Men sometimes wear. We've only really seen Rogue wear a training style outfit for like the briefest of moments in the regular reality, and I don't even really like the training outfits, but even in this case, I think the Jim Lee blue and yellows are, in my opinion, far more interesting than these blue and yellows. My criticism with this outfit is the same as when I criticized some of the other Ultimate outfits in my previous videos. It's just like kind of boring to me without much distinctive rogue personality. Hers is a little bit more different than the other female members' like Jeans and Storms, in that Rogue's has like a full body suit whereas theirs were just crop tops, but I wouldn't say that that difference does Rogue any favors here. Rogue is fully covered up like head to toe in almost all of her outfits anyway, so her not being as scantily clad as her teammates really isn't much of a distinguishing trait for this list. I think the yellow straps across the chest are one of the more unique things about this outfit, but at the same time, they're also one of the most ugliest things of it too. The straps just make her look as though she has like a parachute strapped to her back that's waiting to be dislodged, so again, not doing her any favors. Even though I don't think this blue and yellow outfit looks great on Rogue, she has shown that she can look good in those colors. However, I don't think that this costume is one of those times. Number 16, Extreme Rogue. This was the costume Rogue wore when she was part of Storm's Extreme Team. This team was primarily charged with locating and retrieving Destiny's 13 prophetic diaries, but they also did a bunch of other non-diary related stuff too, like fight aliens, which is kind of like an initiation practice for any new X-Team. 
everyone's costumes were a little bit extra around this time, in my opinion. I can get down with some of them, like Storms is fine and Psylocke is okay, but Rogues is one that I actively do not like. The sleek bodysuit design is fine overall, but every time I look at this, I'm like, is she suiting up to go scuba diving? Something about it just throws me off from thinking of it as like a superhero crime fighting costume and instead makes me think she's about to go swim with some dolphins. The colors of this outfit also just drive me nuts. Unless she's about to announce that she wants to suck my blood, I just don't think the color scheme of fire engine red and dark blue work well on anyone. The Extreme team also wore cybernetically enhanced red spectacles around this time. The glasses gave the team access to like on-the-spot computer technology, courtesy of Sage, and kept them in touch with one another as sort of like a walkie-talkie system. Rogue's glasses had dual purpose though, as they were made out of ruby quartz and they kept her from accidentally injuring her teammates with Cyclops' optic blast. She was able to manifest any power she had previously absorbed around this time thanks to a power boost by Sage, and so these glasses, fashion faux pas that they were, at least had some necessary functional use for her. I liked Rogue in general around this era, and although I thought giving her access to the menagerie of powers within her body was an interesting twist, I also thought it really overpowered her. And unfortunately, nothing is more boring than an overpowered X-Man. Her power upgrade didn't last too long though, and she soon lost all of the powers, including her natural absorption abilities, and so she ditched the X-Men and thankfully ditched this costume as well. Number 15, Death Touch. This was the costume Rogue wore when she was the leader of one of the strangest X-Men lineups ever. Cyclops gave her carte blanche to form her own team, and alongside X-Men mainstays like Cannonball and Iceman, she also drafted wild cards such as Mystique, Omega Sentinel, Lady Mastermind, and Sabretooth. It was a very weird time, but it all kind of worked because there was inherent conflict within the team this way, and it made for some interesting dynamics. When it comes to this costume, I don't mind it overall, but I just think it's a lot to take in with that giant hooded cape. I love a cape on a superhero, but I much prefer it to be something that billows as opposed to something that just drapes long and heavy, and that's kind of what this one looks like it's doing to her. The green and white bodysuit underneath it is all fine, and she's worn a variation of this in a lot of her other costumes, which I'll get into in a bit, but I just kind of think that this giant blanket that she's wearing as a cape was like an unnecessary addition, and maybe should have been a bit more tailored before she put it on. Rogue's powers took an interesting turn around this era as she developed her death touch ability. She was injected with the experimental Strain 88, courtesy of Dr. Pandemic, and it essentially threw Rogue's powers into overdrive, where instead of just temporarily absorbing a person's power and psyche, the slightest touch from her would instantly absorb everything about them and wipe out their existing essence completely, essentially killing them. It was not a fun time for Rogue, and she was forced to absorb 8 billion minds with her augmented power when the Hecatomb came to Earth, and so needless to say, she went a little bit crazy with all those voices in her head. Even though I don't really care for this costume, I did really like Rogue around this time, and I thought that her death touch was a very interesting way to level up her no contact policy. Number 14, Revolution. The Revolution era was Chris Claremont's return to the X-Men after being away from it for like a decade or so, and he shook a lot of things up with the line, starting with giving everyone a totally brand new makeover. I'm lukewarm on a lot of the designs of this era, but Rogue's outfit is probably one of my least disliked ones. I think it really worked for her. It's got her trademark green and yellow colors, and even though that giant X across her chest is a bit ostentatious, I don't really mind the branding too much, and I think that the overall design is complementary to Rogue's usual covered head-to-toe shtick. 
This outfit is what Rogue wore during one of her first formal leadership roles within the X-Men. She was voted to be team leader during the Revolution era by the other members of the team, even though it didn't seem like it was something that she really wanted to do, and she was more or less forced into it. There wasn't like an election or anything, and she only became the leader by default because everyone else was too busy to do it. So to me, that felt a little bit weird because it kind of felt like the gang was being all, well, you're not our first choice, but you're our only choice, so you're gonna do it. The Revolution era is also when Rogue first began manifesting the powers of all the abilities she had absorbed in the past. This happened because she absorbed a Skrull, and the Skrull DNA mixed with the Kree DNA that she had previously absorbed from Carol Danvers, and it all just created totally adverse reactions with her own DNA. She was initially manifesting these powers totally uncontrollably and at like random times, so it was really chaotic, and it's why she had to eventually give up that leadership role that she won with the X-Men. After a period of time, she gained a pretty good measure of control of being able to like call up a random power when she wanted it, but then she got depowered and lost absolutely everything for a while before her natural abilities of absorption eventually reasserted themselves, but this time as like a blank slate. The one thing I really don't like about this design is her hair. I hate her pulled back, limp looking ponytail. Rogue has worn ponytails before, and I'd say she's worn them much more successfully than this one. If she's gonna rock a pony, then it's gotta be a high pony that bounces around when she flies. You know, something with like life and not some dead looking thing that just crawls down the back of her neck looking like a wet swamp rat. Number 13, Utopia. Speaking of ponytails, Rogue also wore one during her time spent on Utopia, and in my opinion, it, and her costume here, was marginally better than her Revolution one. It was like an emerald green with white accents, so none of the colors popped too much over one another, though I will say that I think it was certainly one of her bustier outfits. Even though it wasn't revealing in the traditional sense, like how say an Emma or a Psylocke costume is, she seemed to always have her cleavage super on display, which I thought was funny given that her role on Utopia was as like a counselor to the kids. Even though she could cover up now and again with that scarf that she always wore, it seemed like the girls were always just out on display, and you know what? I am totally okay with that. Rogue was pretty much the star of the X-Men Legacy book during her time on Utopia, and she exhibited complete control over her abilities, doing lots of cool things with other people's powers. She no longer had her Ms. Marvel abilities, so flying and super strength were off the table for her, and it was interesting watching Rogue be less of a powerhouse and showcase more vulnerability physically than we're used to seeing her do. At the very least, being a regular strength person forced her to rely more on those actual mutant abilities of hers, and she used her absorbing abilities more as like a tool and less as a curse, which was what they were to her for so many years. One of my least favorite rogue panels of all time actually occurred during this Utopia run. I hate it when Rogue absorbs a multitude of powers at one time and chooses to express them all simultaneously. I always think it looks super ugly in the art, even if the intended effect is for it to look cool. She did it here during the second coming arc after she simultaneously borrowed the powers of Colossus, Psylocke, Angel, Wolverine, and X-23 in order to fight off Bastion Sentinels. She's done it before in other panels as well, like whenever she borrowed all the powers of the kids, and whenever she borrowed all the powers of the Avengers and Uncanny Avengers, but at least in those times, she wasn't necessarily expressing them all simultaneously, and so I didn't mind it as much as this mess. From a story standpoint, sure, it's a great thing to get her to do, but ugh, just looking at it makes me cringe. It reminds me of that Combo Man character from the Marvel ads in the 90s. He was like a joke character who had like all the powers of various Marvel characters, and so stacking Rogue up like this just gives her that Combo Man appeal to me, which is like, ugh, so cringy. Number 12, Brotherhoodie version 2. Rogue wore her Brotherhood jumper both when she was a villain as well as when she was a hero. 
It's essentially the exact same hoodie, except for the fact that she had longer hair and less villainous makeup when she wore it as a hero. I kind of think putting this outfit on the cover twice like this is a waste of space, when one of these could have gone to like a more unique looking design, such as perhaps the Brotherhood outfit she wore during the X-Men Adventures comic book series. I always really liked that one and thought it was really cool, so it's a missed opportunity here to not have it on the cover. But whatever, we have the same thing on here twice, and at least she wore them during different time periods of her life. The one here at number 12 is meant to represent the time that she wore the hoodie as a hero, shortly after Operation Zero Tolerance and right up through the 12. This was kind of like Rogue's heartbreak outfit, as it's what she wore after she found out about Gambit's involvement with the mutant massacre, and she took some time out to sort out her feelings. There wasn't really anything too defining about Rogue during this era, in my opinion, other than her being somewhat caught up in Gambit's drama. Rogue is always strongest when she isn't tied romantically to a man, be it Gambit or Magneto or anybody else, so this whole broody Rogue era wasn't really her greatest arc character-wise, but I think because she was sorting out all her feelings, it kind of made sense that she would regress back to this outfit. It felt like she was trying to make sense of everything that she thought she knew, or like she had to relearn and retrust her relationships with people, and so I guess having her wear an outfit that she once wore while she was figuring herself out just lends itself to some nice visual poetic storytelling. Number 11, Brotherhood Version 1. Yeah, so these costumes are pretty much one and the same, though this original one sneaks ahead over the other one ever so slightly, if only because I like this color a bit more than the other one. She was a member of her Mama Mystique's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and she went around terrorizing everybody from the Avengers to the Dazzler to Rom the Space Knight. There's an alternate version of this costume that uses a green striping instead of a white striping, and I actually wish that that was the version that was used on this cover instead of this one, because at least then it would have given some more differentiation between these two Brotherhoody outfits. I think she was only supposed to be like 17 years old while she was a member of Mystique's Brotherhood, but oftentimes it felt like she looked a lot older thanks to the way she caked on her makeup and styled her hair, and I mean, I just thought that was so fantastic. Villainy was not a good look for Rogue, but it was so bad that it was right. This was the outfit that she wore when she ruined Carol Danvers' life by stealing her powers and her memories and her entire psyche, and it was also the costume she was wearing when she ditched Mystique's Brotherhood and showed up at the X-Men's front door looking for Sanctuary. She's done a lot of life-defining things in this outfit, and it's the one that gave her green as her trademark color. It's a pretty simple outfit when it comes down to it, but she wore it during simpler times, and all in all, I have to say, it's really not too bad. Number 10, Age of X. Kicking off the top 10 of my rogue costumes is her Age of X outfit. This was the outfit that she wore when Legion created his pocket universe, and everyone who was on Utopia forgot who they were, and were instead given new identities and new histories. They were fighting a fictitious endless war where day after day the humans would try to invade their fortress, and while the mutants would inevitably successfully fend them off, there were the occasional casualties as well. Rogue's main function in this reality was to act as a reservoir of memories of sorts. She would essentially absorb a person's entire psyche as they died so that these people could figuratively live forever within her and thus never be forgotten. Because of this, she was given the codename Legacy, and she wasn't really allowed to participate in any of the battles, because the cargo she was carrying inside of herself was way too precious. If anything ever happened to her, then everyone she absorbed would be lost as well. I really like this outfit, and I thought it was one of her better, more functional ones. I really like it when Rogue wears black, and pairing it with her trademark green works surprisingly well in a way that we don't see a lot of these days in her outfits. I think she also looks really militant here, but not in like a super front lines -y kind of way. It's like a superhero version of what a war costume would look like. I kind of dissed Rogue wearing a cape earlier when I talked about the Death Touch outfit, but this Age of X costume is an example of a time when I think a cape works well for her. 
Her unofficial nickname during the story arc was Reaper, so I mean, the cape is obviously a nod to the Grim Reaper reference, but that aside, I think it also just looks really nice aesthetically here because it doesn't gobble her up in the way that the Death Touch robe did. It's more stylish and it has like more life to it, which is ironic given that in this world she's essentially the Angel of Death. Number 9, Shi'ar Rogue. Rogue debuted this outfit during one of the X-Men's many jaunts out into space. The Shi'ar needed the X-Men's help against the Phalanx, and the whole team got the Royal Shi'ar wardrobe treatment, including local reporter Trish Trilby. Rogue's outfit was the only one that really made an impression on me though, as it had like a thin force field around it that let her kind of touch people. Even though she couldn't make actual contact with them, it was still closer than she could usually get to people, and so she kept this outfit for a while after leaving space and used it as her regular crime fighting apparel back on Earth. I have a mega soft spot for the Rogue Shiar costume. The purple and yellow combo is unlike anything she's ever worn before color-wise, and even though I think it borders on being a bit garish because both of these colors are so bright and eastery, I do really like this whole thing on her. The pointless accessories like the elbow pads and the shoulder pads and the hip pads are all 90s essentials and I live and die by them. This costume happened around the mid-90s, right around the time young people like myself were discovering the internet and X-Men fan sites were being created all over the place. Even though I wasn't collecting the current monthly issues where Rogue was wearing this costume at the time, I remember seeing it all over the internet on like every website and message board and Alta Vista search, and I have a vivid memory of wasting all the magenta ink from my dad's printer by printing an oversized copy of her in this outfit and taping it to my bedroom wall. I just thought it was such a super cool costume, and I was drawn to it, I think, because it was so different for her. But still, I think it looks like it belongs on her, and I wouldn't be mad if this one showed up again someday. Number 8, Pantsuit Rogue. This is such a great costume. Rogue wore this for a pretty brief stint in the 80s, shortly after joining the X-Men. I think it only lasted like five issues or something while Rogue was trying to discover her identity as a hero. Even though it's hard to call this like a traditional superhero costume, I give it a lot of props for going the fashionable route as opposed to the tights and cape route. I mean, who doesn't love pants and a big belt? But is this outfit practical for fighting supervillains? Eh, probably not. I can understand why it only lasted a few issues, as repairs must have cost her a fortune. It looks like it is something that has been tailored completely out of non-stretch fabric, so even the slightest punch or kick would probably tear a hole right into the seam of it. Nothing about this outfit looks imposing from a superhero standpoint, but I like that Rogue chose fashion over ego. It's just something that looks really different, and I enjoy it when it's stacked up against all of her other costumes, and honestly, the more these outfits play with dimensions and shapes and give interesting silhouettes, the more I'm interested in them as opposed to just seeing the usual skin-tight spandex that we get from most of the costumes. Number 7, Orange Tunic. Rogue's orange tunic phase was another strange costuming blip that just sort of happened for a while until it didn't anymore. And I guess was her first official superhero costume after ditching the Brotherhood romper. I kind of put it up there with her Shi'ar outfit and her pantsuit outfit as being one of the more unique outfits that she's worn. This one is a cut above the rest of those ones for me though, as even though the Shi'ar outfit had like an interesting color scheme and the pantsuit overalls had an interesting tailored cut, this one kind of has both. There's not a single other outfit here that uses the same kind of silhouette that this one uses. The tunic kind of creates like a webbed wing moment under her arms since I guess the fabric is so bulky that it just like buckles in and over on top of her belt. Maybe that was useful to her for when she was flying or something, like maybe it helped capture the winds and soar on them. Kind of like how Spider-Man and Spider-Woman have those webbed armpits, maybe it had the same effect. But just like the pantsuit, I think this outfit had too many impracticalities to make it worth wearing. Her wingspan is obviously hindered by the tunic, and it looks like she's only able to extend her arms so far before the entire garment would either ride up or just rip off. 
I think in the smorgasbord of rogues costumes, this one either usually gets totally forgotten about or is reviled amongst most rogue fans. And at first glance, I totally thought it was horrendous too. But then the more I looked at it, the more I started to appreciate it. And even though orange is so not a rogue-centric color by now, I also wouldn't be mad if this tunic just happened to resurface among her other old costumes on Krakoa. Number 6, Mir Island Saga. So, speaking of costumes Rogue only wore for a brief period of time, this Mir Island Saga outfit I think was literally only worn for like one or two issues at max. She wore it shortly after she visited Muir Island on her hunt to find the rest of the X-Men after everyone traveled to the Siege Perilous. Unbeknownst to her, the Shadow King had latched his hooks into everyone residing on Muir Island, and he soon latched his hooks into her as well. He was bringing out everyone's negative traits, and everyone was acting very out of character, especially the leader, Moira McTaggart, who had organized a tournament where these Muir Island X-Men would fight each other, and this was the outfit Rogue wore while she beat the crap out of Strong Guy. I loved the Muir Island Saga, and I thought it was a great way to give some limelight to some lesser used characters at the time, while not completely removing the main characters of the X-Line from the narrative. What I like about this outfit on Rogue is that it's a way for her to wear the traditional blue and yellow X-Men colors, but with an updated vibe. It's kind of like her ultimate costume in that way, although I think this costume successfully uses the colors and the garments in a way that complement Rogue, whereas the ultimate costume just kind of looked like blah. This costume also has elements of her tailored pantsuit costume that I love, like the lapels at the top, but my favorite part is actually her headband. It's very like Karate Kid, or it reminds me of something that one of the lost boys from the Peter Pan movie Hook would have worn. The Muir Island X-Men team was kind of like a troop of lost boys, at least spiritually, and I loved the movie Hook, so that kind of energy coming off of this costume is something that I can really fly with. Number 5, Savage Land Rogue. The Savage Land costume is probably one of Rogue's most iconic outfits. It's definitely her most cheesecake outfit, but given the circumstances of why she was wearing it, I think we can give the girl a break. After traveling through the siege perilous with all the other members of the Australian X-Men team, Rogue was, I think, the only member who retained all of her memories and life experiences from it, and it was probably in no short order thanks to her psyche having been bonded with Carol Danvers when she traveled through it. The two of them had a bit of a spat after the Perilous tried to separate them, but it turned out there was only enough life energy for one of them to survive, and so Rogue ran away from Carol, not wanting to be responsible for quote-unquote killing her again. She ended up in the Savage Land, where Carol followed her and ambushed her, and even though it looked like Carol might win, Magneto eventually surprised Rogue by showing up and saving her and eliminating Carol from the equation. Rogue's absorption powers had been neutralized by some sort of, like, feedback from her fight with Carol, and so for a while she could freely touch people without fear of draining them, and thus her on-off romance with Magneto began. The two of them teamed up with Kazar and the local Savage Land tribes to fight off the evil Zaladane and her Savage Land mutates, and they won too, but Magneto's true bloodthirsty colors turned Rogue off from him, and she left the Savage Land shortly after her powers returned. What I like about this costume is that it's Rogue finally being unabashedly free. It's sexy as hell, and that's a bonus, but overall what it says to me is that Rogue is no longer afraid of anyone touching her skin, and so why not enjoy that for a while? Rogue is always covered up, worrying about other people touching her, hoping to save them from the distress that she might cause, but here she is finally able to do what she wants for herself, and what she wants is to wear this tiny, tattered bikini rag number. The overall vibe of it is like super Tarzan and Jane, right? Like it's totally got that Savage Land aesthetic down and even though it looks like she was scampering to gather any rags she possibly could, she managed to find green and yellow ones which would soon become her trademark colors. This is Rogue's most revealing costume of them all, hands down, but I dare say that it's also her most liberating one. 
even if she does fall prey to the male gaze while she's wearing it, I can at least appreciate that there's purpose behind this costume. And I think that her being able to wear something this revealing helped boost her confidence up a whole bunch compared to when she's just forced to wear chin to toe onesies and not express how she really feels through her costuming. Number four, Age of Apocalypse. There's not really an Age of Apocalypse outfit that I don't love, and Rogues is no exception to that. The AOA was an alternate timeline that was created after Professor X's son Legion went back in time to kill Magneto, but accidentally ended up killing Xavier instead. The incident created a splinter world of what would have happened had Xavier not been around to peddle his dream of human and mutant coexistence, and the result was a dystopia ruled by the immortal fist of Apocalypse. In this reality, the X-Men were still freedom fighters for the cause, albeit their number was severely diminished and they were led by Magneto instead of Professor X. Rogue was one of the main characters of this reality, but instead of having Ms. Marvel's flight and super strength, she had half of Polaris's magnetism, so she could still fly by levitating herself through manipulating the electromagnetic spectrum, and somehow the magnetism also gave her like a degree of her invulnerability and augmented strength. One of the stark differences here though was that Rogue could touch at least one other person without fear of absorbing his psyche. That person was Magneto, and he and Rogue became a romantic item in the AOA, the two of them co-leading the X-Men, and even having a son together whom they named Charles. I really, really enjoyed Rogue's portrayal during the Age of Apocalypse. I thought she was a badass character and a great leader, and I really liked how she put her family first above all else. Having a family and birthing a child just never feels like anything that could ever come to pass for Rogue in the real world, and this Rogue probably also thought she'd never be able to have a family either before she met Magneto. So when, through like a weird quirk of fate, she was able to, it made sense that she would feel extremely overprotective of baby Charles, and that she'd be damned if she was going to let anyone take him away from her. In terms of this outfit, I think it's another great example of a cape being worn to full effect. Of all the capes we've seen Rogue wear, this one is most definitely my favorite. It just has the most presence of them all, and I think it's a crying shame that it isn't being added to the recently announced AOA Rogue toy that's coming from Hasbro. The look just feels incomplete without it. One of the best aspects of the cape is the bolted collar neckline that's like there to hold it in place. It and the cape are both references to how Magneto classically wears his cape, and it makes sense that that would be the case since she and Magneto are a thing in this reality. The bolts add like a fun element of industrialism to an otherwise very bright costume. I also really enjoy the big, puffy, ruched up sleeves that she has going on here. They remind me of sleeves from like an 80s oversized jacket that a girl might wear like over her prom dress or something. It's like she's cut the sleeves off that jacket and has just sewn them here onto her costume for dramatic effect because there's really no other reason for them to be so gathered up here other than for the drama. Overall, I think this is a lot of nonsense in the costume, but it's nonsense that just looks right. Even if the bright colors of the costume make no actual sense for her to be wearing in like a dystopic future like the AOA because she stands out like a sore thumb, I think for the sake of embodying superheroism in this bleak world, everything that she has going on works really well for her and she looks like she's a power boss leader. Number 3, Outback Rogue. This was the outfit Rogue wore while the X-Men were hiding out in the Australian Outback. Roma had just brought the X-Men back to life after they sacrificed themselves on live national television in order to stop the adversary during the fall of the mutant storyline, and they decided to strategically keep their resurrection a secret from the rest of the world as a means of getting the jump on their enemies, so to speak. You'll hear me say this all the time, but the Outback was my absolute favorite era of all my favorite X-Men eras, so I'm hard pressed to ever diss anything that happened during those days. One of the most interesting things to happen with Rogue during this era was that she and the Carol Danvers persona inside of her kind of had come to terms with one another in terms of like sharing Rogue's body. Rogue obviously felt super guilty about everything that she did to Carol, and now with Carol finally reasserting herself, it only seemed reasonable that the two of them should have equal measure of living life even if they did have to share the body. 
I don't think either of them particularly enjoyed doing this though, and it was a pretty short-lived alliance before the two of them eventually fought for body supremacy, but I still thought it was a really interesting plot point while it happened. What probably irked Rogue the most was that Carol was actually able to control Rogue's mutant abilities and touch people with her bare skin when she was in control of the body, whereas Rogue still could not. I can only imagine how extremely frustrating that must have been for her, but at the very least, it did show Rogue that her mutant power is actually controllable if only Rogue could figure out how to do it. This is one of those costumes where I really like Rogue wearing black as a co-dominant color. I personally really like the black and green, just like the Age of X costume, and I think it gives her kind of like a female wrestler vibe just by the choices of which aspects of this costume are green and which ones are black. Even though it's a pretty simple costume when you look at the sum of its parts, I like the way the boots and the opera gloves are all kept really long as to cover up her skin and keep her cut off from people's touch. That is kind of Rogue's thing after all, and so like most of her costumes, it's also reflected in this one. But here, I just find it to be a lot more striking, and I think it is because of the black and green color combination. It just pops really well. And I mean, look at this hair. So big, so bountiful. It's like double the size it usually is. It looks like a heavy mane for an otherwise petite girl, and I respect Rogue for giving us the volume of our dreams. Number two, Aerobics Rogue. This is the period of time when Rogue started to really have a lot of fun with her costuming. She ditched the orange tunic and the tailored pants suit and picked up a black bodysuit instead and just went ham with the accessories. Sometimes she'd be wearing a crop top and belt bottoms, other times it'd be an off-the-shoulder t-shirt and a bikini bottom. You never really knew how she was going to dress day to day. I'd say this rogue was kind of her at her punkiest with the X-Squad. She was a full-fledged member by this point and was finding purpose with the team and feeling trusted enough to be able to express herself in fun ways like this costume. One of the best storylines to come from Rogue during this era was when Dazzler joined the team. Dazzler did not trust Rogue at all as they had butted heads back when Rogue was a member of the Brotherhood and she almost killed Dazzler. Allison had been seen to be using the Danger Room to hone her skills and she actually programmed the room to use a visual of Rogue as the antagonizing force for her workouts. Rogue was not too happy about this when she found out. The two of them came to actual blows over it, but honestly, it felt like that's what needed to happen for these two before they could finally find peace with each other and learn to behave as co-workers, if not necessarily just as friends yet. What I like most about this costume is how casual but trendy it looks. I think it's pure 80s the way she just layers accessory after accessory over top of that black onesie, but I think that alternative 80s style is actually something that Rogue excels at. A lot of her greatest costumes, according to me, have a sort of 80s look and feel to them, so it's no surprise that I would find this one great as well. It's probably her most 80s, right down to the aerobics instructor feel of it, but I mean, if it works, it works, and I think this costume most definitely worked. Number 1, 90s Rogue. As much as it kills me to pick the most obvious possible choice for number 1, I can't deny that the classic 90s Rogue look that she's most well known for is also probably my favorite of the bunch. It's definitely the costume that defined her for like an entire generation, and even though the 80s were paramount to her character development, she never really found her voice until the team split up into blue and gold, which was when this costume debuted. There's an argument to be made that this wasn't really Rogue's limelight period because she was so enraptured in Gambit for pretty much all of it, that her chasing that relationship overshadowed any actual time getting to know her. And I see the value in that argument, but I don't totally agree with it. I do think that Rogue spent a lot of the 90s pining over Remy, but I think that through her relationship with Gambit, we really got to explore a lot of Rogue's inner workings. It was the only time she was ever really vulnerable with someone romantically like that, and it let us see a lot of different sides of Rogue. Up till this point, the only things that we really knew about her was that she was like super guarded and that she kept people at a distance because of the uncontrollable nature of her powers, which is totally fair and valid, but now she was also happy and joyful, and while still unable to experience everything that she wanted to experience, she was in the midst of discovering a side of herself that she had never been able to explore before. 
I really like their relationship, and I think it's especially interesting because of how volatile it is. But her romance with Gambit aside, I also just think that this costume nails who Rogue is. Honestly, pretty simple. Just another bodysuit with a belt and a jacket over top. But Rogue is a simple gal, and anything too ornate wouldn't feel authentic to her. In this instance, I think it's the color design that really sells the garment. She's worn a lot of bodysuits, but something about these earthy greens and yellows just really make this one pop. I think it's also because she's got that big, bountiful, curly hair going on, and yes, even the undersized bomber jacket, which was all the rage for some teams in the 90s, really adds the final touch in bringing this all together. It's an iconic costume, and it has sort of like an ever-fashionableness to it. It's like it's plain enough so that if it's needed to, it can pass off as a modern day outfit and it's not going to stand out like something that was clearly a product of its time, like what some of the other iconic superhero costumes ultimately end up looking like. All in all, I think it's the best costume that Rogue's ever worn, even if it did already have the popular vote even before I chimed in about it. So that's it for this video. I wouldn't say that Rogue has had the most varied costumes of all the X costumes out there, but there are definitely some hits and misses within them. Let me know if you think I nailed it with this list, or if you would have chosen a different order of things. I'm always curious to read what others think, so please leave a comment or two about your thoughts on Rogue's wardrobe choices. If you liked this video, you can check out my other costume ranking videos, or browse around my channel for a collection of other varied X videos, where it's all X-Men all the time. I want to thank you for stopping by and checking this video out today, and I welcome you to come back again soon for more great X-Mentations.